Hey guys, it's Tiara with Herbology.org, and I'm here with the lovely Lisa Campbell. Thank you so much for coming in and talking with me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. So she is huge in this cannabis industry, especially here in Toronto, but she has even done stuff overseas. So can you tell me a little bit about how you started in the cannabis industry? Sure, I got involved in cannabis through drug policy reform. Uh, before drug policy, I was involved in harm reduction, so I was always really focused on cannabis as a drug. <laughs> um, I was really lucky to work with Canadian Students for Sensible Drug Policy as the outreach director right when legalization was taking off in the States. So I got to go to a lot of drug policy conferences all over North America, including Mexico, and just learn about the emerging industry. Uh, it was around that time that I noticed that there was a lot, a lack of women in cannabis at the leadership level. So I decided to put everything down and dive fully into cannabis. Oh, that's amazing. Okay. So your main goal was like to try to fix some of the issues around like the drug policy that, that currently existed. Yeah, my goal is to legalize and regulate all drugs. And then I saw cannabis kind of emerging. I mean, obviously, I still have that as an ultimate goal. But when you see something that like is on a path to success, it sometimes you just have to kind of hunker down and focus. Just and go with it. It's the first step. Love it. All right. So uh, when, would you, when did you first try cannabis? Like when was your first experience actually using the plant? Probably when I was a teenager um, on the Toronto island. Um, I went to like an island party and there was like a group of my friends who were smoking it. I think I got to smoke the roach, which I was like so excited for. <laughs> now that's disgusting. But <laughs> when you're 15, it's pretty exciting. Um, so yeah, I've always smoked since I was younger. Um, and I probably started consuming more regularly when I was 18. And I've probably been smoking cannabis at least once a day for the past 10 years. So it's really been a part of my life. Yeah, so you use it a lot. What's your main main consumption method? Like what would you use? Uh, joints, pipes, bombs? Mostly just joints, yeah. Mostly just joints? All right, nice. I love joints. Uh, for me, I don't know, I go into like multiple different ways. Like I either like the joints, I have like a phase. I'm either into totally joints, totally bongs, totally vapes, or then I go right into concentrate. So always kind of mix it up a little bit for me. Yeah, I'm, well, I'm really excited for legal concentrates to come to market because everything that we're seeing in the gray market is finally going to be available in the legal market. So. so what are we seeing with that? What is, what's coming up in terms of concentrates and, and edibles? What are we looking at in the legal market that's going to be coming up? Uh, well, in Ontario, we're looking at everything from shatter to wax, keef, um, full melt, live resin, rosin, anything that you can think of in the illicit market will be coming online, including vape pens. So, so even solvents based um, concentrates will be available. Yeah. I know that's one thing that a lot of people were, were concerned about, that there may only be solvent, uh, solventless extracts like rosin, etc. But uh, that's really nice to hear that there's going to be a lot more variety for people to choose from. Yeah, and it'll be regulated too. Like I've had really good experiences with concentrates on the illicit market, but also like really sketchy experiences. The worst shatter experience I ever had, I went to my local dispensary, bought a gram of shatter, I uh, heated up my rig, put in a dab, and the dab actually like flared. Oh my God. Yeah. So, you know, when you have it regulated by Health Canada, it's less likely stuff like that will happen. Properly Which purged, you're not going to have any more butane left over because yeah. I'm assuming that's, that's what made it flame up. I mean, uh, or it could be residual pesticides too, right? Because like, when you blast something, it also concentrates the pesticides if there's any pesticides used in production. So I think now that we have lab testing as mandatory, it means we'll be able to screen out a lot of those contaminants. So I know there's been a lot of talk around um, like this topic of pesticides. Now, with the legal market, what, did, what are we seeing with these LPs? Are they, are they still using like any pesticides? Because people are a little confused with that. Like if we're going to try to move in from like the illicit market to the legal market, what are the main differences that they're doing? To, that are going to showcase that? So the main difference is that uh, Health Canada has a list of approved pesticides. Um, in the black market, it doesn't matter. Like People use pesticides anyway. When you hear about uh, the early days of licensed producers getting bested with pesticide use, um, a lot of those growers came from the illicit market and they're just bringing the same growing techniques to the legal market. Um, so there have been some recalls in the legal market, 
but at least there's a system to recall versus totally. like not having any accountability at all or like any knowledge of what's in your substance. Um, so personally, like the, the licensed producers that I work with, I make sure that it's their goal to use as little pesticides as possible, especially once you get to the flowering stage, there's no point, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's going to come back in testing that yeah. it's contaminated. So. Um, you know, sometimes when you try and use as many organic methods as possible to control things like pests or any other um, contaminants, like powdery mildew. Um, but yeah, there's this myth in the existing legacy market that all licensed producer cannabis is like, uh, you know, tainted with pesticides, uh, that it is irradiated, that it's poisonous. Cannabis is just cannabis. It doesn't matter if someone who's growing it is legal or illegal. It's exactly the same plant, exact same pathogens, exact same ways of mitigating those pathogens. So um, really it d depends on the grower and we're finding some really cool growers in the second wave of legalization. Um, for example, there's this company called Good Buds that just got licensed out of Salt Spring. They're the first outdoor license in Canada nice. and they're 100% organic. Wow. Yeah. That's very different to what we've seen so far. So that's going to be a really nice uh, little ray of sunshine in the organic uh, aspect for sure. Yeah. I mean, having it as certified organic is another thing, though, because a lot of the starting <laughs> material, like if you're getting your clones from a facility that's not certified organic, as soon as you put it in a certified organic ground, then it's not organic. So yeah. it's like, I think companies are trying to be as organic as possible. Like WeedMD, they're licensing 25 acres of outdoor certified organic. Um, but of course, once they put those clones in, it won't be like Completely certified. certified organic. <laughs> yeah, right. so, so it's like, I think no matter what company that we work with at Lifford, we're looking for the most sustainable growing methods possible. So um, that's who we choose to work with and partner with. So you mentioned Lifford now, um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Lisa is the CEO of Lifford Wine and Solutions, the uh, cannabis uh, component of it. Can you tell me a little bit more about how that kind of came about? Um, for sure. So Lifford Cannabis Solutions is a subsidiary of Lifford Wine and Spirits, where we are right now. Uh, Lifford is a family owned company. We've been around for 25 years and uh, we just got into the cannabis space over a year ago. So um, when legalization was coming, I, you know, was in talks with my family about, okay, you know, it's going to be the same route to market as alcohol. What, what does that mean for in terms of the services that we deliver? Uh, cause personally I have no interest in selling alcohol <laughs> at all. Um, so that's when, uh, you know, we were in talks about potentially pivoting Lifford to focus on cannabis. Um, it's interesting cause at the time I was really pushing and didn't really get much leeway. And I kind of gave up at a certain point. I was like, okay, bye. I'm going to move to Columbia. Like, <laughs> There's a really awesome legal industry there. Um, if I can't work with my family company, I'm just gonna work full time down there. Um, I think that scared the shit out of my family. <laughs> I can totally imagine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so they did not want me to move to Columbia. Instead, um, that's when I got the go ahead to take Lifford and steer the ship towards cannabis. Um, so that started, I think we made the public announcement last April. So over a year ago, and uh, currently we've signed up, you know, multiple licensed producers across the country to help bring their products to the legal market. That's amazing. Congratulations again for that, by the way. That's like a, a really big step towards, you know, this change. I mean, there's so much stigma around cannabis. Like, I'm sure you experienced the same speaking to your family with it, right? And uh, a lot of people are dealing with that. When you first told your family that you used cannabis, what was, what was their reaction? Like, does anyone in your family use cannabis as well? Yeah, my dad smokes weed every day. Okay. <laughs> it's like, we're, it's super, super normal for us. Um, I probably didn't smoke with with my dad until I was 21 because there's like, you know, there's still stigma, right? Of course. The fact that it was not a legal substance. Um, so I remember like the first time that we smoked weed together was really special because um, for so long, like, you know, it was not socially acceptable. It's still, there's still so much stigma even though it's legal. So um, it's definitely been something that we bond with as a family. But since legalization, my mom was like really opposed to cannabis before and like really looked down on it. Now she's baking my dad edibles. No way. Wow. It's so cute. So <laughs> now it's like going a zero to a hundred. Wow. That's amazing. I love it. Yeah. That's really nice to hear. I know my parents, when they first um, 
when I first brought it up to them, they were totally against it. They were like, we don't do drugs in this house and all of that. I was like, you know, it's not a drug though. I mean, it's a plant. And I went through a lot of research to showcase, you know, what it is that this plant actually provided. And I think after they started to see some of that, it kind of, you know, decreased the stigma around like, oh, okay, well, maybe it's not so bad after all. And it was just like, you know, educating them slowly, uh, little bits here and there. But once you kind of give people education, it's really hard to be ignorant to the plant. Yeah. yeah. So does your family come around? A hundred percent. All yeah. my entire family smokes now. Like it's crazy. We all smoke together. We have this little place in the uh, kitchen in my, my parents' place and they have like a nice little vent and uh, we, they call it happy hours, like O-U-R-S. So oh it's my like God, I want to come over your family. And we all just smoke together. We'll pass the joint around every night and before we go to bed, we smoke together. So it's definitely something that has brought me way closer to my family. Um, I've bonded so much with my family in terms of cannabis and it helps me grow as a person because it helped me find my passion right and now I'm here yeah. interviewing amazing people like you also in the cannabis industry and um, it's definitely a, a good way to see it move forward yeah I definitely think it brings families together 100%. because even if you're like fighting you just smoke a joint and like all the tension just dissolves just calms right down right yeah a hundred percent so can you tell me a little bit about uh, your international work with cannabis? Now, I know you're a part of um, a couple of different programs. Can you tell me about that, like in Colombia? And sure, yeah. So I've been, uh, like many, many years ago when I left Canadian Students for Sensible Drug Policy, I got involved in the Women Grow Network. So that was a network of women uh, around uh, the world who were engaged in cannabis. So we organized monthly networking events. And around that time, uh, a similar group started in Spain called Mujeres Canábicas. So Mujeres Canábicas, for those that don't speak Spanish, <laughs> is a cannabis woman. So very similar to Women Grow in terms of mandate and supporting women in the industry, promoting diversity. Um, so Mujeres Canábicas grew as fast as Women Grow. Uh, it started in Spain at Spanibus. We had a whole encuentro. There's tons of photos actually on Getty Images um, of that those first meetings. And it was very like Spanish style, democratic, like everyone sat in a circle. We all shared our vision for you know what we saw as the future uh, and the programs and initiatives we wanted to create. Um, there are a lot of women there uh, from Latin America, so it, it very rapidly spread to Latin America. So now there's um, different women in cannabis chapters all across the Americas, uh, from Canada to Ar Argentina and Chile. Um, so from that first encuentro at Spanibus, I ended up being invited uh, to participate in Mujeres Canabicas in Colombia for the very first Expo Medeweed. Wow. So uh, that was their first first expo. Now there are so many expos in Colombia. It's really exploding. There's I think there's one like this weekend. There's scientific forums, medical forums, business forums. So Colombia has just completely exploded since then. Um, back then there was uh, less than six licenses. Um, people were waiting their processing licenses. Um, I think the following year there was around six licenses. Now there's over 140 licenses. Wow. So <laughs> Colombia has just exploded completely. Um, it was really eye-opening going to Colombia. I'm sure you guys know. Yeah, we were there, there around the same time as you actually for Expo Medway during that time. And it's incredible to see, like, I mean, everyone grows cannabis. The amount of like awareness around the plant is drastic. I mean, I was not expecting that going to going to a country where it's illegal, you know? Yeah. And it was beautiful to see the amount of people who were who were using it, whether they were elderly, whether they were, you know, people in their twenties wanting to use that instead of alcohol. It was it was beautiful to see. Yeah, it's so weird in Colombia because like it is illegal to consume, but you can grow it. So everyone's allowed um, up to 20 plants. Everyone says 19 because then you're safe in your restrictions. Um, and then indigenous people are allowed, allowed to cultivate as well. So Colombia is um, produces the most cannabis in the world currently in the illicit market. Um, so the first year I was there, I was like very cautious because it was right when the peace treaty was signed. So, um, you know, everyone was really high on security, didn't want to fuck around. Uh, the second year I was way more adventurous. I went to Caoca, which is where they produce you know, the most cannabis in the world, just in this tiny little province, uh, which, you know, former FARC territory, so the FARC had just demobilized or demilitarized there. And then uh, I think shortly after that trip, like 
things have really, there's a lot of instability in the Americas right now. I mean, obviously there has been for a long time, but um, a lot of violence has increased despite the police peace treaty. Um, just in the last few months, uh, the Colombian military has ordered that they double their kills and captures of guerrillas. So um, it's very, it's been, it's, been very very different over the past three years and obviously there's this huge industry there and the industry needs uh, protection from the guerrillas so it's like this positive thing and it's supposed to be about the peace process but then there's also these big massive grows in areas that you know have experienced a lot of violence and uh, so yeah I, I have very mixed feelings about it um, after I left the second year I went uh, my tour guide was murdered Oh my God, that's horrible. Yeah, it was really, really heavy. Um, I think the ho hostel that we were at was firebombed. Um, the, obviously, this is not in Medellin or Bogota. Yeah. This is like, you know, in former FARC territory. So very, very different. Um, but, you know, even last weekend, I went to Mexico because they're just starting their regulations there and did like a, a workshop for future entrepreneurs down there. and. Um, you know, the violence even in Mexico, Mexico City has just like exploded. Increased a lot. Yeah, so not to get super heavy on your show. No, but not <laughs> at all. I mean, you know, this is exactly what, what you know, people want to see. They want to learn about these things because it's one of the things that are not being talked about, you know, unless you, you've gone there and you've experienced it, it's really hard to showcase what's going on internationally in cannabis culture and the cannabis industry. But yeah. I mean, it's very important if we're really going to try to achieve international legalization, which is something that I think that we are all really, really looking forward to. I can see that other countries are starting to, you know, slowly come around. Israel has uh, taken it off of like their their horrible drug situation, and they're finally like accepting medicinal cannabis. And I know Israel's been like the medical hub of research, so it's so nice to see this like progression forward. Yeah, and everyone around the world is kind of watching cannabis, or sorry, Canada for cannabis. Yes. So it's so interesting when you meet people from like Israel or Mexico or Colombia, and they're like, how is it going? And of course, everyone here in Canada is complaining. They're like, oh, it sucks. Like the products suck. They're all dry. It's poison. But like to everyone else in the world, they're like, holy shit, Canada is legalizing cannabis federally and they can smoke weed in the streets depending on what province you're in. But like, I we think definitely that- definitely take advantage of that now. <laughs> oh yeah. But like, I feel like we're so privileged as Canadians complaining about legalization because you know, at least we're not going to be um, raped for consuming cannabis or thrown in prison for indefinite time, which is in Lebanon, if you have a joint, they can throw you in prison for as long as you want. And if you have a rich family, like maybe you can get out. And if not, maybe you'll be there for years without trial. Mm -hmm. So like we're so privileged and lucky to be in Canada to be able to enjoy this plant. And obviously legalization isn't perfect, but um, we really are creating a model for the whole world to emulate. And the fact that we've gone rec federally is, yeah, it's just, I mean, obviously Uruguay is a little bit ahead of us, yeah. but we're setting an example for the world. Yeah, Uruguay uh, legalized recreationally in 2013 and uh, they have definitely made uh, quite a bit of progression since then. Uh, just going there uh, with my wife last year, we, we saw the, infrastructure around cannabis and it was beautiful one of the best expos we ever went to was actually in uruguay so definitely see that for sure now i know that you've definitely come into this legal market and there's so many opportunities for people but coming from the black market what do you uh what do you feel about the black market now like how do you see the black market yeah i mean people are really picking apart these terms too like i don't even know if black market is the best term but it's funny because like in the legal market we always talk about like oh with legalization our goal is to eliminate the black market or to eliminate organized crime i think like when you're in the black market uh, or the legacy market whatever you want to call it it can really feel like stigmatizing and alienating and othering with statements yeah. like that um but i think like the goal of legalization is to eliminate organized crime. We want to be able to have cannabis businesses that are legal, where we're not going to be, um, you know, hurt by the police or uh, targeted by nefarious characters or, you know, so for me, eliminating, eliminating the black market, which is like what people talk about all the time, is really about eliminating it from being a dangerous 
industry to be in. Because, you know, coming from the black market, <laughs> um, I've had friends who have been robbed. I've had friends who have been beaten. Um, there's been like a lot of violence. Uh, you know, my friends who've had their kids threatened to take, have their kids taken away. Um, so it's like, those are all the things that I want to eliminate. I want to eliminate it from being, not to say that like everyone who is in the illicit market is in a dangerous situation. I think like your average dealer, whether you're in Mexico City or Toronto, is like, you know, hanging out. They're like kind of, it's kind of like that show High Maintenance where you have the guy that's like biking around and like hanging out with cool people. Like it's not a bad job to have. Um, but there is that element where you have like those casual like dealers who aren't like your tr traditional organized crime that intersect sometimes with organized crime and then end up like having really scary situations happen where they're like, oh, maybe I do have to carry a gun. And that's awful. Like, I don't wish that on anyone. And that's what I, it's like that element that like when you have legalization, you don't need to worry about protecting yourself because you're protected under the law just like any other citizen. Yeah. And obviously like there's privilege that plays into that. And obviously not everyone in Canada feels protected by the police, but it's like, I think that we see um, legalization and the black market as like being like this, mm -hmm. but really it should be seen as like an opportunity to participate. It's obviously super hard though, like yeah. to deal with all the regulations, to have to pay taxes. Like I know growers who haven't paid taxes in decades. And the first thing you need to do when you have a legal cannabis grow is like register with CRA. So I think for a lot of folks in the legacy market, like it does seem threatening, but like look at California, like look at all of the companies that have transitioned over that were in the gray market before and now have legal businesses. Obviously the states is not the perfect example <laughs> because they can't pay, you know, they can't have traditional banking. Like there's all kinds of fuckery that you have to do in the states to have a yeah. legal company. but. Um, like I do see a lot of legacy brands, especially from the ed edibles market, in high demand in the legal market now. Yeah. So there are joint ventures that are being made, people are partnering up, like it's very possible that your favorite brands from you know past green markets or uh, natural buds markets, like you're gonna see those brands partnering with licensed producers and actually having their products in the legal market once edibles come about especially since it's taking so long. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. That's definitely something people are concerned about is how long it's taking to put all of this into place. And I know other areas in Canada have like different models. Like we have right now currently just like the OCS with like the few shops that are open. And I think w some of the people's main issue, or at least from the, you know, the black or legacy market, as you mentioned, um, is that they're finding it extremely difficult to, to get into the legal market, you know? Like they are, they've been the ones who, I mean, we're the, we're only here now because of these people, you know, like they, yeah. they fought for us, they've done all of this for us. What advice do you think that you could give to somebody in the black or legacy market uh, to try to try to move into the legal market? Like what steps could they take to be able to achieve that? You need to have a transition plan. So your transition plan can't be like, I'm going to sell illicitly until I have a deal. Like your transition plan could be like, okay, I'm going to sell illicitly until I reach the sales goal. I'm gonna take my product offline. I'm gonna, like, for example, when I was transitioning out of the gray market, I had several conversations with my lawyer about like, what does transitioning look like? So get yourself a really good cannabis lawyer, um, get your numbers together, like figure out uh, what your assets are and what they're worth. So for example, you might have like a certain uh, proprietary tech uh, in your extraction or you know how you make your product. Um, you might have a list of customers that you've engaged with. You might have, um, you might trademark your brand, for example, and that trademark might be worth something. So like figure out what your assets are and, and make a transition plan. And um, one of the things that um, my lawyer helped me with was <laughs> doing like exit interviews. And I've done this with some of my clients um, who are from the legacy market of just like, okay, well, when, is, when are you gonna turn the tap off so you can be compliant and not in the black market so that someone can scoop you up and you can figure out the best place for your brand. So um, I know a lot of brands have had to stop production because of that, because they wanna transition. And 
we basically have time. Like edibles, the regulations are coming in June. We'll have the final regulations. And then from like June until December, that's when you have, that's when all the companies have to, uh, or basically in October, they're gonna have to amend their licenses and then submit all their product formulations to Health Canada for review, which is minimum 60 days. So we're probably not gonna see all these products until January, yeah. unless there's some like revolution. So but I think that's like uh, one of the issues that like people are so concerned with and that's why so many people in the black or legacy market don't wanna get out is that it's not just about, for example, the money for them, but the fact that people who have been coming to them for decades who desperately need this help and are using it to get through their day, to get through it medicinally, et cetera, and know that they can get these products that are currently not available right now through yeah. um, our legal markets. Uh, it's very hard for people to be like, okay, well, you know, we're just gonna, we're gonna leave you guys and hopefully the government will, will take care of you at this point. But I mean, w what steps do you think that the government needs to put in place so that they can actually provide for these people? Because I mean, now they're saying, they're out of they're out of weed. They're out of cannabis for in all of Canada. So yeah, well, they're definitely not out of weed. There's tons. Um, so Health Canada has put out lots of reports on uh, how there's actually a ton of weed available. Um, so the government's not saying that. The government's saying we have enough weed. Uh, the provinces, depending on the province and the agreements they have with the licensed producers, are they're not getting what they said they would give them. So some provinces are saying they're getting like 20% of what they ordered. Um, so a lot of the licensed producers have over-promised and under-delivered. So that's super shitty. <laughs> but I do think that a lot of the product that is in their inventory right now that's not on shelves is for edibles, beverages, extracts, etc. And people are basically like saving up for when they are able to produce all these products because it's gonna take an enormous amount of product. Um, a lot of people are taking their flour and like running it into hashish yeah. so they can just like have that crude oil ready for when vape pens come online because they're gonna be doing thousands of units a month, right? So it's really, it's really hard to say like where the problems are but every single country that's legalized has experienced uh, supply chain issues. So yeah. Nevada is a, like a really good example. Um, the first few months there were shortages, it makes headlines, and it also artificially inflates the price. So it really, um, it's not so much a government issue, it's more just supply chain logistics. How can the government um, put into place, you know, these like legislations or something where they even start maybe licensing, you know, growers that are not currently in the legal market yeah. or uh, try to figure out ways to do that so that we can we can push this ahead. I mean, at this point it, it was like from 2017 to 2018 to 2019, and, yeah. you know, it's like we keep moving and pushing and pushing and pushing and it's like I, I totally understand there's a lot that we have to take into consideration. There is. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, cannabis consumption, whether it be recreational or medicinal, there's a lot around it. But I mean, we are seeing other countries or you know cities like Colorado and all of these other places who have done these things already. Yeah. And you know they're having a lot of success. I mean, their economy has been boosted drastically. So what can we do to kind of you know imitate that? Well, it's funny because talking to folks down in the states uh, last summer, I was told that like we're lucky that we don't have edibles right away because there's so many kinks in the market in Colorado, in California, and all these legal states that they actually wish that they had more time to actually have solid regulations in place before they had those product types. So it's kind of ironic. Um, like for example, when I was in California last time, uh, they had switched to um, like no standards for edibles. It was like nonprofit collectives that were creating them to you know standardize licensed businesses where with, with standardized doses um, they also switched from uh, non-child proof packaging to child proof packaging maybe back to child proof packaging like it just their regulations are as fucked up as our regulations yeah. and entrepreneurs are just as much as in limbo in terms of like well how do we do our packaging how do we do our labeling I know that this product is 10 milligrams but my lab test is 2.5 so that's what I have to put on the bottle so um, there's all kinds of fucked up things that are happening in those markets. So I feel like with Canada, the way that we're doing it, it's in phases. And those phases exist for a reason because we are a science experiment for the world. 
Yeah. So everyone's going to be looking at the data that comes out of Can Canada on legalization because we have baseline data for you know pre-legalization of flour and oil to post to now we're introducing all these new product types. So like edibles and concentrates, yeah. Yeah, but in terms of like legalizing more growers, Health Canada is like on it. They're waiting for the applications. They've only got 200. So, yeah. I mean, that's a lot of that has to do with the stigma of the legacy market not wanting to register with the government. Like I said, if you haven't paid taxes for 10 years, you're not going to want to showcase so, that yeah talk to Sarah like, and be like hey, hey. I, I grow weed <laughs> yeah I grow weed I've been doing it for 10 years and just in case you didn't know now you know <laughs> yeah so Health Canada has actually been doing outreach over the last week uh, to all of the micro producers so um, they've gone to Victoria Vancouver Kelowna um, Niagara uh, we were just in London yesterday for the consultation and they're also doing Halifax and Montreal so they're visiting as many communities as they can to engage and be transparent about the regulations. Uh, they've also said that it doesn't matter if you have criminal charges. It depends on the nature of those charges. Obviously, if you're associated with organized crime in any way, either you or family members or your loved ones, um, you're not going to be a part of this legal market if you have past associations with organized crime. But if you have charges for cannabis, like they do not care. Like, it yeah. does not mean you're a criminal. Because that totally defies the whole purpose of, I mean, charges for cannabis, but you're trying to get into cannabis. I mean, yeah, I mean, like they're actually legalizing it. So exactly. they're saying it's not a crime just by like making it legal. So, 100%. Um, so yeah, they were like really, really transparent. And they're even considering, based on the last week of consultation, changing the security screening from pre application. Wow. So that means that you don't have to like build a whole facility and then do your security and like, oh, maybe you'll fail. You can do that first, find out, and then if you are security cleared, then you have the go ahead. And they're not just gonna like reject you if you get something wrong. They're gonna work with you and say like, hey, I don't see like your security perimeter. Can you show me this? Or um, they're just like super transparent and accessible. So. Um, even before this interview, I was about to email Health Canada about the regulations because they had suggested that um, the amendments that are coming out, it's already live and public what sections will be amended around the new version of the regulations. So, so yeah, Health Canada is accessible. Don't be afraid of them. Um, what they don't like is being yelled at. And, uh, you know, a lot of activists yell at Health Canada. Uh, so at the Vancouver consultation, uh, David Malmo Levine, who's like an old school cannabis activist, uh, screamed at Health Canada and like wouldn't stop and had to be escorted out by security. So I think like what a lot of activists forget is that people who work for government are also people. They have feelings. If 100%. you scream at them, they're not going to listen to you. Yeah. They're just going to be like, okay, bye. <laughs> so. I mean, at the end of the day, we all love this plant. Uh, this is the reason we got into this. And, uh, you know, whether black or whether legal market, the whole point is to showcase this plant. The whole point is to showcase the benefits that it has and to help people along the way. And I think that if we kind of go back to finding the core root of why we started all of this, I think all of the little frills will kind of start falling into place slowly. But it's obvious that... Um, you know, the legal market is making its, uh, its attempts to try to get into this area, into this industry. And uh, all we can hope at this point is that we don't lose uh, the culture that, that really brought us into this as we go along. But um, I really want to take, uh, thank you for coming in and, and talking with us, or actually, sorry, having us in here, this beautiful uh, place here, Lifford. I uh, really appreciate your time. Yeah. And uh, if you guys are looking for uh, any more information on Lisa, you can check her out. She's on Instagram. She's on Twitter. She's on LinkedIn. And if you're looking for any more cannabis information, check out herbology.org, or you can hit up us on Instagram at herbology420. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs>